Luke chapter 18. One of these days after I've uh, been here about 25 years, I'll get this, uh, the idea of this on and off switch on the microphone. And uh, many times you'll hear, hear me talk in a service and you can hear me through the microphone and then uh, uh, you, you, you can't. And I just want you to know that's no fault of the three excellent guys up in the sound booth. Uh, that's just me forgetting to turn the switch uh, the right way when we transition in, in worship today. But Luke chapter 18. It is really good to not only be in God's house this morning, but it is really nice, very pleasant. And it, it has even ministered to my heart this morning to get to be with my church family this morning. And to see you, not just on the hear your voice on the telephone, but to see you guys uh, face to face. Uh, in the back here against the wall, Emily is sitting back there. And uh, so glad to have her with us today. You know, this is her. She's worked for Pinecrest up in the, I don't know, the kitchen and anywhere else that we could use her. But this is her last week uh, with us as a camp employee. And I just wanted to take a moment, recognize her, thank her for her time and years of, of service and uh, if you've ever been up to the kitchen you've probably been waited on by her and she'll always greet you with a smile and and take care of you but she has leaving Pinecrest for the wild blue yonder as she enters into that young adulthood we're happy for her you're working at Stockholm nursing home right Stockhoff okay and uh, working on your uh, nursing degree right very good. Very, we are so ha we're sad for us, but we're very happy for you. And uh, congratulations. Can we just give her a little round of applause? <laughs> just really happy for her this morning. But let's look at Luke chapter 18. And if you were with me, if you were with me this Wednesday night, you know that we looked at this text. Uh, but have you ever opened God's word and a scripture grabs a hold of your heart in a way that it just it just won't let go it just will not let go and this week as i uh, looked through god's word and was looking at other things my heart just kept going back to luke 18 you know jim don't don't let go of luke 18 just yet and so i i thought i would share that with you i know a few of you were with me uh wednesday night when we looked at it but I'd like, I'd like us to look at it again, uh, especially in light of uh, the emphasis this service is going to put on prayer. But Luke chapter 18, and um, we're going to read the first uh, nine verses there. It's a, it's a short reading. Uh, this is a unique passage because there are two parables in it, and the first two have to do with prayer. And there's a couple times in the other Gospels, there's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In some of the other Gospels, whenever Jesus would tell a parable, sometimes at the end of the parable, he would go back and explain the meaning of the parable. But in this instance, in verse 1, Jesus gives the reason for this teaching, and he gives the reason for the telling of this parable and I think it's relevant to where we are. I think it's relevant to where I am. I think it's relevant to where the church is today as we endeavor to be a praying church and a church that values prayer. Uh, let's read the text together, verses 1 through 9. And it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she eventually won't wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. 
And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I've been a, a part of this church now for a little over four years. And I've had the, the blessing and the privilege of, of getting to know you guys. And I, I've heard you all pray. I've heard about the things that you're praying about. And some of these things that you've been praying about, you have been wrestling with for a long time. Right now, as I look into your eyes and I look into your faces, I can look at different ones. And I can probably name at least one or two things in the last four years that I've heard you pray about. When, we, when we've gathered together and we take prayer requests and your hand goes up, you know, I can know nine times out of ten what you're going to say. And we're all like that. We, we all have people that we love. We all have things that we're concerned about. And from time to time, God will put a special burden on our heart. And we begin to pray about this or, or that. And it just seems like there's a struggle to see any change. And sometimes we're even a little impatient with uh, the spiritual progress that we really want to see. We're, we're so uh, attached to the faces that we care about. We want to see change immediately. And we don't always see that change or we don't always see what we're praying about. But just because we don't see with our eyes what we would like to see, that does not mean that God has not heard our prayer. And that does not mean that God is not working. And sometimes we, we get into a stretch like that and we, we might be tempted to think, well, what's the use? You know, I've prayed about it a zillion times. I've wrestled with it about a zillion times. Um, is God really going to answer this prayer? Is he really going to give me uh, the answer that I need? And and God, God will answer your prayer. But God may not give you exactly what you have in mind. And so for the kingdom to go forward and for spiritual growth to take, for, for a breakthrough to happen, sometimes the dream that we have has to die so that we can put our faith in God's dream and what God wants. God will answer your prayer, but he's not going to answer it on our calendar. Sometimes I think that people on the phone have no calendar. They have no sense of time. They have no sense of schedule. You call someplace to get help and it's automated. Press two if Spanish, press three if English. You press it and you go through and you think you're going to get to talk to a person and then you get another menu and, you know, there's 12 items on and it's not a food menu, it's an option menu. Then enter your nine-digit code. You know, God is not like that. And so if, if God want, needs us to wait for something, it's always with a purpose. And it is, it is always with a plan. And so this morning, if you've been praying about something and you've come to a season of discouragement and you feel yourself slipping away, you feel your devotion to prayer beginning to slip away, then this parable is for you and this parable is for me. Uh, verse 1 says, Jesus had this teaching. He told this parable to show his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. Sometimes we, we start off so very well, but we don't end well. And here Jesus wants us to end well. There's a, a channel of water between Great Britain and France, and it's, the, it's called the Channel Swim. And I'm sure you've heard of it. It's actually a 21-mile a stretch of very rigorous swimming. And, and people will try to cross the channel and they'll put their little speedos on and then they'll take a special kind of grease and they'll coat their body 
with the grease because even during the prime swimming season, that water only gets to be about 60 degrees. And so they put all that grease on and they try to swim the English Channel. And it's a, that's a noble task. It's an it's a arduous task. Um, swim even for an advanced swimmer and most of the people who have tried this have either died or quit a few people have actually swam the whole thing but most people either die or quit and there's a number of reasons why they quit number one because it's hard because it's difficult because sometimes the tide is against them. Sometimes there's logs. Sometimes there's sharks. Sometimes it's the, the fumes off the escort boat that they're following as they try to make this. Uh, sometimes there's debris. Sometimes it's cold. Sometimes it's hypothermia. Sometimes they're not as in shape physically as they should be. But there's a lot of reasons why people simply give up. But there are some very important things in life that we care about that we simply cannot give up on. We need some stubborn tenacity when it comes to prayer. There are some things in life that are too important to give up on. There are some things in life that I just don't want to merely put into the hands of man and hope that it works out. There's some things that are very, so important to me that I don't want to leave it to chance. I don't want to leave it to luck. I don't want to leave it to what some people would call fate. You know, the, the raising of our children and the, and the health of our families, as much as I trust doctors and as much as I trust teachers and other caregivers and other people who have influence over my home. I don't want to leave the spiritual health of my home simply in the hands of man. I don't even want to leave that in my own hands by myself. If you're going in for an important uh, health procedure or, or, or you're in a period of, of stress, Leaning on our own understanding is a dangerous place to be. And we simply don't want to leave the important issues of life to chance or to luck or to the expertise of somebody else. That in the big things of life and even in the small mundane things of life, I want to bring those things to Jesus. There's a widow in our text and she was a, a widow without a man. And I, and I know this sounds very, uh, uh, me, it sounds very messed up, but in, in her day and age, a woman had no voice in court unless she had a husband who would plead her case or present her case. You know, she had no rights. Women were like property, you know. And so she had no legal right to a lawsuit or no legal right to a hearing. And also in that same town, there was a, ju there was a, 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 a judge there. And the Bible says in two places here, he didn't fear God and he didn't care about the needs of people. In other words, he was corrupt. And being a widow, she was unlikely to have had, even if she wanted to bribe him, she probably didn't have any financial means to do that, being a widow. But one thing she did have was a problem. She had an adversary. And I believe everybody in this room, you're all nice, good-looking people. You're good, kind, Christian people. But I believe in our lives, we all have at least one adversary. At least one. I don't like to think that I do, but I'm sticking my head in the sand if I, if I don't acknowledge that. And his name is Satan. And then after him, there's probably others. And there are probably people in this life that are in an adversarial position uh, against us in life. They don't, they don't adhere to our philosophy of life or our, our code of conduct. They don't believe in what we believe. And they position themselves many times as an enemy. And Jesus said we are to love our enemies. But many times we need an answer. 
Sometimes an adversary comes in the form of a health need. Sometimes it's a financial need. Sometimes an adversary can be the future, the unknown. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. But this woman had no recourse except to go to this judge and she had no options, no money, no man, but she could be persistent. And so she was, she was persistent. And even this unjust judge who was a sinner, who cared nothing about God and cared nothing about people, the Bible says even he decided that because of her persistence that he would make sure that she gets justice. Even a guy like that. How much more if a, if a sinful judge can bring justice like that because of persistence, how much more does our Heavenly Father want to answer those who come to Him consistently and persistently? You know, to be persistent means ongoing. It means to not give up. It means not to lose heart. It means to, to stick with it. It means not to give up means a, like a stubborn tenacity. But to be persistent in prayer means you've got to have faith in the one that you're calling on. Yeah. No one who was ever persistent in prayer uh, was lacking in faith. We have to have faith. That's why Jesus says at the end of that story in verse 9, he says, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You see, Jesus is coming again. And we are an end times church, and you've heard this a zillion times. We are an end times church. I'm an end time pastor. You are end time layman. And Jesus is coming again. And he is going to be looking for persistent believers. People who are, have been knocking on the door of heaven for needs. And people who will knock on the door of heaven loudly, persistently, and faithfully. Lord, I, I really need you. I need your wisdom in this, Lord. My nephew's not saved, Lord. Would you, would you soften his heart so that he might hear the good news? Lord, I've got this medical need that won't go away. Doctors have operated on three times. There's no one else to turn to, Lord. Persistent prayer. Lord, we've got a ministry decision coming up. I need clarity, Lord. I need clarity. Lord, our nation is in a mess. We need revival, Lord. We need revival, Lord. And you know, this year we have seen, we have seen with our eyes, probably not with our hearts, but we have seen with our eyes kind of a mock repentance for these things. And we've seen horns tooted and we've heard trumpets blow and we've, we've heard the word repentance and we've heard, heard on TV and everywhere else and on videos uh, prayers for repentance. But you know what? When we come and we pray and we repent, repentance is in prayer. This is a little side sermon. This is a freebie. But when we repent, we not only pray the prayer, but we go out with the right behavior too. And so if we are praying and we're persistent and we're not seeing any change whatsoever, could it be that we've prayed the right thing, but we haven't behaved out what we've just prayed about? Because repentance is a change of heart. Faith means that we're not just going to pray about these things, but when I'm done praying, I'm going to leave this place. I'm going to say, hey, I've given this to Jesus. I've talked to him about it. I'm going to rest in this. I'm going to believe that revival is on the way. I'm going to believe that God has already sent it. I'm going to believe that the healing is already on its way. 
I'm going to behave differently. We can't just come and be sincere and pray and, and cry and go through a box of tissues without the corresponding behavior, which is where faith begins to hit the road. That's where the, 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 the shoes begin to hit the pavement. We begin to live out what we've just prayed. Amen. We can throw around repentance and we can throw around revival as much as we want. But until we start believing and behaving as though revival's on the way, it's never going to come. Persist in your prayer. Yes. But, but being a person of persistent, faith-filled prayer means I'm not just going to pray about it here. I'm going to go out and I'm going to live out what I just prayed about. Does that make sense? If you're following me, say amen. 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 But God honors the prayer of the persistent. And sometimes if we're waiting, there's a purpose for the waiting. And boy, that's terrible. That's a, I shouldn't say terrible. It's, it's, it's difficult. That's a difficult place to live. Sometimes God has a different timing than what we've got. And, and there's a number of reasons why that happens. Sometimes we're allowed to wait or we're allowed to suffer so that our witness, our witness can be shared with other people. If you're being faithful to God, people are going to notice that. Especially through hardship. Especially through hardship. People know, because there are so many quitters in life. But the person that sees to it to the end, they're going to get noticed. That witness is going to, boy, Kim must really believe in what she's doing here because she's, she's sticking to it. And, and, and you know, well, from time to time, we hear great testimonies of endurance. And we hear great testimonies of patience. And we walk away from those services and those videos and we think, man, I wish I had a testimony of endurance or I wish I had a testimony of faith. And if you want that, you can have that. But that means you've got to endure the hardship. You've got to endure the hardship. Recently in my, my personal devotional life, God has led me to the letters of Paul and the Holy Spirit has put on me to read to read the letters of Paul, especially the passages that talk about the hardships of Paul's ministry. One of my best friends in the whole wide world is sitting right over here on the front row. Fellow minister of the gospel. And I wish I could go over to Pastor Tammy and I wish I could say, Pastor Tammy, in your ministry, there's not going to be any hardships. She'd love for me to say it, and she would love for that to even be true. But that's not true, and that's not good preaching, and that's not biblical. And so we've got to decide in our heart, if we're going to be a bunch of quitters, and the people that leave at the first sign of trouble, the first sign of inconvenience, or are we going to stick it through? My brother Brian the other day, and I, I don't have it in front of me, I wish I did, he wrote a little essay. He's a great writer, by the way. He wrote a great little essay on winter, and he used winter as a metaphor for hardship. And he wrote about how winter reveals things. Hardships reveal things, folks. They reveal who we really are. They reveal who, what we're really dedicated to, what we're really committed to. And, and when we give up prematurely, that reveals a lot about us too. Tell you what, COVID has revealed a lot about a lot of people. I knew I wasn't going to get shouted down with amens on that one.
I'm going to say something, and I hope that you love me after I say it. But it's been a year now with COVID. And we know what COVID is, and we know what COVID is not. Now it's time to get back to the business and the ministry of the church. If you can go to Walmart and eat out in public, then you can come to church. Persistence. It's been a year. We've had time to absorb it. We've had time to see what it is. We've had time to see what it's not. But it's time to get back to the business of the church. If we have an outbreak in our fellowship, we'll use common sense and we'll take precautions. But it's time to get back to the business of the kingdom and to the business of the church and persevere persistency with what God wants for us. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we're allowed to wait to strengthen our witness to other people because people are watching Sometimes we're allowed to, to suffer and wait a little bit because it grows Christ-like character. And I know this is not popular either, but you know, God is more concerned about this journey that we're on. We, we've discovered through the Peter series that there's a process that God uses to make us more and more Christ-like. And that's God's primary concern for your life. God is more concerned about your journey to becoming more Christ-like than He is managing your pain or making you happy or making you prosperous. In fact, God often uses pain. God often uses poverty. God often uses suffering to make us more like Him. Because as, as human beings, we tend to listen to him more when we're in pain. We're more apt to run to him and learn deeper dependence on him when we're inconvenienced and we're hurting. Yeah, that's a tough one to swallow. But it's true about you and it's true about me. And so God, every once in a while, God will allow things to come into our lives to challenge us. This woman was way in over her head, wasn't she? She had no one else to speak for her. Her only hope was the judge. And I want you to know this morning that our only real hope is Jesus. Our only real hope is Him. And faith is waiting for what Christ is after. We sometimes have to wait so that we're prepared to even receive that answer. There's something in our heart that has to take place first before we can enjoy that answer. And so Jesus is coming back. He says that, verse 9, will the Son of Man find faith on earth when He comes? And I hope that He will. I hope that when He looks at us, He'll say, what a, what a great church, uh, full of stubborn tenacity. They just wouldn't let go no matter how hard the devil pulled or how hard the flesh pulled or, or how weary they got. This is a church that, that just would not give up. When my kids were little, I can't do that now because they're too big, they would whip me. But I used to chase them around the house and I would wrestle with the boys and I would pin both boys on the floor with their arms stretched out and their legs pinned and I would tickle torture them and I would do it till they cried I give up I give up I give up and sometimes I would count I would say I'm gonna count to ten see if you can stand this tickle torture to the count of ten and and I would count a swan as my fingers went across their skinny little ribs until they finally gave up and the devil is like that he wants to pin the church down
and he's counting slowly. And he wants us to lose heart. And he wants us to give up. And he wants us to cash it in. Did you know that, that prayer, prayer renews the soul? It renews hope. It renews vision. It renews clarity. Prayer can even revive unity. Prayer is one of the few things, and somehow the Holy Spirit does this, and it's above my pay grade to, to even speculate how it works, but somehow the Holy Spirit even uses unity to bring people together. It'll unite a marriage. Married couples start praying together. It's amazing how quickly husband and wife can get on the same page if they're praying together. It's amazing how quickly a pastor and board can get on the same page if they're praying together. It's amazing how a camp staff can get on the same page if they're praying together. It'd be amazing to see how fast a nation could come together in unity by praying together. Some of you have been praying about a lot of things for a long, long time. And I want to encourage you not to give up. Be stubborn about it. Grab onto it as, as much as you can. And Jesus will reward that kind of faith. We're going to call the church to pray. And, and I've talked to about a half a dozen of you. And uh, there are many that would like to be anointed. And I want to encourage you if... If you want to come and sit on the front row, if kneeling's an issue and you want to participate, you can come and, and sit on the front row. I'm going to ask those that need the front row if they'll just go ahead and come. And I know there's, there's a few of you um, that have...